Hey, would you pray with me as we begin uh, this new series? Father, thank you so much that you don't send us out on our own, in our own effort, without any instruction or out any help, and just send us to the Lord. Thank you that you have totally equipped your followers to do what you've asked us to do. So, Father, I pray this morning that as we consider these words that are very challenging, that are very uh, compelling, but, Lord, they are lofty. Lord, I pray that you would just bring your spirit, that you'd be calling us to yourself, that there wouldn't be any kind of spirit of condemnation or guilt or anything like that, but, Lord, that you would encourage us, that we would encourage one another to follow you into, uh, into this world like you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to begin this morning, we're going to read two scriptures, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. We're going to read Psalm 67, and then a portion of Matthew 28, and over the next four weeks, we're going to be deep diving into Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. But I'd like to start with Psalm 67, because I think it sets up, lays a foundation for what, where, where we need to begin as we discuss this idea of the Great Commission as followers of Jesus. And it says in Psalm 67, if you'd read with me, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you. God, may all the peoples praise you. May the the nations be glad and sing for joy for You rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the people praise you, God. May all the people praise you. The land yields us harvest, God. Our God blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Psalm 67. And now Matthew 28, and I'm going to read verses 8 through 10, and then 16 through 20. 8 through 10 is kind of the link from last week and and Easter Sunday and talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And it says this in verse 8, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, (laughs) which is so cool. We, we, We should go, we could spend an hour on that. They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. How beautiful is that? I, I, we can't get distracted on it, but that's awesome. And ran and reported to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, rejoice. And they came up and took hold of his feet. What a beautiful picture. And worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go bring, go bring word to my brothers to leave for Galilee. And there they will see me. And then let's skip down to verse 16. And this is what 16 says. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated to them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, this is where we're going to drill down over the next four weeks. And Jesus came up to them and, and said, and spoke. This is risen Jesus speaking to his disciples. And this is what he says. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to follow all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. That is big. Uh, This past week, uh, I had the privilege to uh, uh, have the opportunity to attend a conference with uh, my wife and then uh, Dom and Jamie and Brian and Stephanie and the six of us went. Uh, we also went with uh, some of the folks from uh, Lex Baptist were there too. So that was fun to kind of go together from Lexington. We had a little contingent that went and it was so great. We, we went to a conference called uh, Together for the Gospels, put on by the Gospel Coalition. It was so great. I, I mean, it's like anytime you go to one of those events, uh, with, with that size of a crowd and, and that depth of teaching, it was like five hours of preaching for 45 minutes. Wouldn't it be great? Let's just do it. No? Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you. It, it, it was great. Well, it, it, we left Monday. We spent two, Tuesday was there. And then uh, Wednesday, I, I 
sort of told our folks, listen, uh, I need to pull out of, out of some of these for this day, and I got to just take a chunk because I, I, I have to write a sermon. And Wednesdays are typically, I know, shocker, I, 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 work, I do work more than one day a week. It, and Wednesdays are typically the chunk of time that I like to do typically that I like to give solely just for, for preparing for Sunday morning and my sermon giving. And so, uh, so they went on without me and they went to the conference and I stayed back in our little Airbnb and, and uh, began working on this. And I'd been, you know, you know, we work on these months in advance. And so then I take what I had gathered and I'm, and I'm praying over it. And so, Lord, would you lead? It's kind of a great place to start when you're preparing a sermon. It's, you start with prayers. So and I'm, So I'm praying over this series and this message that I'm supposed to give this morning. And, uh, and all of a sudden my phone just starts buzzing. Bzz, bzz, right? And it's, well, I don't even know why they call it silent mode because it's not silent at all. My phone just starts blowing up. Bzz, 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 and I'm trying to ignore it. And I'm like, Lord, would you lead me in this sermon? Would you com- just communicate Lord, just reveal what I'm not supposed to say, what I am supposed to, you know, I'm just, zzz, 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 and my phone is like, so I'm like, oh my gosh. So I finally pick up my phone, it's like 17 new messages. I'm like, oh my. So I start looking at them, it's all from our folks. The first one's from Dom, Matt, you're not going to believe it. David Platt's preaching. I'm like, awesome, right? Okay, the next one, uh, it's from Brian. Uh, Matt, you're not going to believe what he's talking about. The next one. Megan, honey, I think you should have been here. You might want to get over here. Yeah, and they start going back and forth. Brian's, dude, he's preaching on the Great Commission. <laughs> Dub, Matt, I think this guy's preaching your sermon. You got you to gotta listen to this. It was like over and over and over again. And like, so, so I'm there trying to write a sermon on the Great Commission. They're listening to the sermon on the Great Commission. And so I was finally like, all right, Lord, I'll take the hint. So I pulled it up. Thank God it was live streaming. So I, lo- I watched it. I watched it again. It was great. So, so I felt like the Lord sent me six and a half hours away to Louisville for you to hear at least the first part of the sermon on the Great Commission because I got to experience it. So I'm going to, this first part of this uh, sermon this morning, I, it's, I'm stealing it. <laughs> I am because I feel like I'm supposed to. And let's be honest. All preachers steal everything. We just forget where we stole them from, and then we call them our own, right? So it's fine. So this first part of the sermon is going to be, I I just heard this from from a guy named Dave Platt, and he spoke it to us, and we absorbed it. So now I want to share it with you, and and it's it's great. And I think it so perfectly shapes the rest of the series that we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. So this morning, if you've got your notes, and there's uh, notes in the back if you've, if you've got them. If not, uh, they're there every week. But if you're looking at your notes, we're, this is where we're going over the next few minutes. We're going to do, number one, four truths every disciple must remember. Number two, four excuses every disciple is tempted to give. Number three, four affirmations every disciple, is, every disciple needs to apply. And then fourthly, four declarations every disciple must continue to leave, live. Okay? So let me go to so just for your head, so we're going four truths, four excuses, four affirmations, and four declarations, okay? And each of those four points also have four points. So it's a 16-point sermon. So we'll be out of here by 315, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me. So we're going to hit some stuff as an overview, and, and, and I hope that, man, we come back, and, and, and this raises some questions, and we're going to drill down on some more of these over the next several weeks, Okay? So what I'd like to begin with are these four truths every disciple must remember as we consider the Great Commission and our lives as as disciples of Jesus going into the world as his followers. Four truths. Number one, here are the four truths every disciple must remember. Number one, the ultimate goal of of God is his glory enjoyed and exalted among all the nations. That's the first one. The ultimate goal of God is his glory enjoyed and exalted among all the nations. And as we look at the overarching story of the Bible, we see that proclaimed over and over and over again. That his glory would be enjoyed and exalted among all the nations. In in Psalm 67, we see that, verse 3, may the people praise you, God. May all the people praise you, verse 4. May the nations be glad, uh, verse 4. That the nations of the earth 
verse 5, that all the people praise you. Psalm 7, Psalm 67, 7, may God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth, that all the peoples, that word nations is, it, sometimes we get confused when we hear the word nations in the Bible. That's, that's not like what we think of as nations in today's society. It's not like, that means, you know, U.S., Brazil, even Russia, right? No, no, they're talking, that word is like ethnos. It's, it's, a, it, it's better translated like all the people groups of this world. Number one, the ultimate goal of God is His glory enjoyed and exalted among all, all the nations. So that means that our joy and our gladness are found in God's greatest praise. Number two, that means that the ultimate goal of every Christian and every church is to enjoy and exalt God's glory among the nations, those ethnicities, those people groups. So that not only we, He is being enjoyed in our lives and experienced and in relationship with, but then that is being proclaimed and exalted over all the earth. We're not only called we're not, only, uh, not only are we created to enjoy Him, but also exalt Him among all the earth. Is Christ exalted in your life? Is He lifted up? It means what are you living for? Number three, God's plan for the accomplishment of this goal is called the Great Commission. And it's given directly by Jesus to His followers. And then fourthly, this Great Commission that has come to be known as this, this Great Commission that we've just read in Matthew 28 is not a general command, but a specific command to make disciples among all the nations. Okay, so if God's ultimate goal is to be enjoyed and exalted, and our ultimate aim is to enjoy and exalt Him, and His directive is for His disciples to live this out in our worlds, then what keeps us from doing it? Say that again. Okay. So if God's ultimate goal is to be enjoyed and exalted, our ultimate aim is to enjoy and exalt Him. His directive is for His disciples to then live this out in the world around us. Then what keeps us from doing it? I'll be honest. There's several things. I come up with all kinds of excuses. I'm going to be really transparent. And it's kind of embarrassing. How much time do we have? Do I have to do it? Maybe I can get away with not saying it. Now I can't. Gosh. Okay. Last Sunday, this is, this is how apparent it is. Last Sunday, we had an incredible worship, worship time together. I mean, just the body of Christ. And we're singing and we're praising this risen Jesus. And it was, it was it's Easter. And I'm, I'm, I'm on my way home from, East, from that service We'd cleaned up, and I was pretty tired, pretty exhausted. Uh, we had dinner, right? We're fixing lamb. It's going to be great. And I pass on the road a, a couple on the side, and their car was parked, and they were standing next to a tree that had a cross pinned to it and lots of flowers around the tree. It was very clear what had happened. There had been an accident there, and they were there remembering that person, and they were holding each other. I said, I need to stop. I need to stop right now when good to go visit with those people. It's like, stop, stop, stop. And then I was like, that's, that's going to be weird. That's going to be really weird, right? Like, if I just, like, some stranger walks up to these people having a moment, God, that's really weird. And then it was, it was like, no, you should stop. And I went a little further, and it was like, yeah, but what, what, what do I even say? I don't know their story. And I just kept going. And I said, listen, I, I've, I've got other things to do. God's probably got somebody else in their life. And it, it, I didn't. I didn't turn around and I didn't stop. And it's eaten me up all week. Because I feel like I missed it. I feel like God specifically told me to pull my car over and turn around. And just be present with somebody. And I didn't do it. That's reality. And man, as Christians, that happens to us, right? Thankfully, God is faithful. And he's good, and he's pursuing all of us. And even that couple, I pray for him. I've been praying for him. Like, God, give me another shot, right? Like, give me another chance. I hope they're there this Sunday. I'll let you know if they're there. <laughs> I'm just being, I'm trying to be honest, because I, listen, sometimes we hear these sermons, and we're like, well, man, I really stink at this thing. 
guess I'm going to go crawl into a hole. Like, no, that's not the intent. The intent of this is to equip us to go with the confidence and the power of Jesus, not to just give us a guilt trip. And the reality is we miss it sometimes. I think we miss it because we make some excuses, not even knowing it. I was, I was making excuses. I didn't even know it until the Lord really convicted me this week. Reasons why we don't obey the Great Commissions is one, reluctance. Reality, we don't want to. We don't like being weird. Uh, most of us don't like people feeling awkward, right? We just don't want to be like high-pressure salesmen. Hey, you like Jesus? Right? Like, we think that's what's in our head, and we, we don't want to do that. We don't, we don't obey the Great Commission because we don't want to, number one. Number two, number two is we don't think we can. We think that we're incompetent. We're not able to close the deal, whatever that means. Or we're afraid that we won't get it right or say exactly the right thing. Number three, I don't, I don't think this about y'all, but I think sometimes we don't care. We're, we're indifferent. We don't care that others are born, they live their entire life, and then they die and go to hell without ever having the opportunity to see, hear, and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I learned this past week, there are more people on the planet of the earth right now who have never seen, heard, or had the opportunity to respond to the gospel. There are more right now than at any other time in the history of the world. There are more people right now who have never heard the gospel than any other time in the history of this planet. As the population increases, so does that number. How are we responding? So I think subconsciously sometimes we're just a little indifferent. And then fourthly, fourthly, we don't believe it's our responsibility. Somewhere along the lines, in Western Christianity, we bought into this lie that says that is the missionary's job abroad and it's the preacher's job at home to get people saved. And we miss it. We miss the opportunity for that growth, that, that life-giving exaltation that we were created for. I think that these excuses in my life begin to fall away as I remember these four things that are explained in the Great Commission. Number one, the Great Commission tells us who's in charge. Number two, the Great Commission tells us where we're going. Number three, the Great Commission tells us what it is that we're doing. And four, the Great Commission tells us how, it is exp how we are expected to, be, to live, how, how the Great Commission is expected to be lived out. And the unifying force behind all of the who, the where, the what, and the how of the Great Commission is Jesus Christ. The Great Commission, we read a, Dom and I were reading a book in preparation for this series, and it made this claim I thought was beautiful. The great, he said, the Great Commission should be called the Gospel Commission because it's all about the gospel. And I think our excuses begin to be diminished and the Great Commission begins to be realized and lived out as we, as we fully understand the gospel, what it is and how it shapes us and how it changes our lives. The Great Commission redefines our focus as disciples. It tells us the posture of a disciple, marked by Jesus' authority. It tells us the direction of a disciple into the world of the, as, uh, with the gospel. It tells us the di discipline of a disciple, focus on Jesus' command. It tells us the presence of a disciple with a presence of Jesus. But all those things, these, these declarations, this, this line that, G, that he's sending us on, as we, as we begin to understand the gospel deeply, fully, those excuses get, start to begin to, to, to be set aside. And we begin to be equipped by Jesus himself. Disciples of Jesus never stop learning, relating, communicating the gospel. Here are four declarations every disciple must continue to live. Number one, the gospel is good news. 
when we understand that the gospel is good news, we can't help but to begin to share it. Like, it's not weird. It's not awkward. This is like the greatest news we have ever heard and experienced in our entire lives. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. I love that. Such a good, perfect picture of who God is. He is both loving and generous. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word, that word begotten means the, one of, the only one of his kind in relationship. And it's also uh, like it, the only, it's the very unique one of a kind. So the, the NIV set, translates it, uh, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son in the world, into the world to condemn the world. How beautiful is that? But to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Friends, that is amazing news. That is great news. We are not condemned. We are not condemned. Through grace, by faith in Jesus Christ. But whoever does not believe already stands condemned because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. When we are personally and daily confronted with this life changing reality of the good news of the gospel, it's not only enjoy, but it, it, it can't help but be exalted. It flows through our lives, out of our mouths, into every conversation we have. We can't help it. It's the greatest thing before sliced bread, right? It's great. Man, if you've never heard that, if you just heard that news right there, and, you th- and if you've never put your trust in Jesus, and you've just realized now that you're currently standing condemned, today's the day. You get to become a follower of Jesus. Put your trust in him. If you've never done that, make today to t- today. Here's what I want you to find anyone in this room who is a Christian and tell them you want to start a relationship with Jesus. They will totally rearrange the rest of their day for you to give you great tracks to run on and to walk with you through it. Number one, the gospel is great, great good news. Number two, the gospel is clear news. Sometimes we, we think that we got to get it right or say all the right things or spin it just right. Or I, it's clear. It is so clear. You were created to be in a relationship with the one who created you. But this thing called sin entered the world, and sin separates us. We miss the mark. We live life on our own terms, and, and we've been separated from the one who created us. And because of sin, we experience death and suffering and destruction an eternal separation from God because he's holy and he's just and he's good and all of a sudden we're not. And life is not the way we were supposed to be created. But God in all his love and all of his generosity became fully man in the person of Jesus Christ. He lived the perfect life. He died death on the cross for our sins and he was raised again on the third day So that we, so that we, by grace, through faith, we could be saved. It's simple. It's easy to disqualify ourselves from thinking that we have to over-communicate this thing in a fancy way. It is not. It is clear. The gospel is good news and it's clear news. Thirdly, the gospel is saving news. Guys, the gospel is the only news that saves. There is only one news in this world that is saving news. Sometimes we forget that. We'll dig into this a little bit later, but uh, there's a church in this town called Corinth. As you read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, it's kind of obvious that they were kind of a hot mess kind of like the church in America today. There are a lot of issues, like all kinds. I mean, all kinds of crazy, and, and, and some, some things that needed to be paid attention to. And Paul said, I, he deals with some of them, and he says, hey, at a later time, I'm going to deal with some others. When I get there, we'll do it in person. 
He makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 15 what the biggest, biggest, most important thing that he had to deal with was. The main thing. He says, now brothers and sisters, in verse 1, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have been in, it has been in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. The gospel is the only news that saves. That's it. The only one. What news are we spreading? What news are you consumed by in the morning while you drink your coffee? What news are you retweeting on your way to work? What news are you Instagramming at red lights? What news are you talking about over the lunch table? What news are you complaining about at the dinner table? What news keeps you up at night as you lie awake in bed? Is it the saving news, the ultimate eternity gospel news of Jesus Christ? It is the only news that saves. The only one. That's it. This is the news disciples of Jesus are privileged to exalt, to, to make known. It's good news. It's clear news. It's the only saving news. And lastly, the gospel isn't just saving news. It is sanctifying news. We're going to talk about this in a few weeks. But remember, if you can remember back to our Roman series, or even the first Peter, first Peter gets into this. The gospel isn't just for salvation. It's for sanctification. They're made into the image of Christ. And we... We truncate the gospel when we buy into this lie that the gospel is supposed to be heard, prayed, and then we move on and work like the Dickens to earn it. We truncate the gospel when we fall into this lie that says the gospel is to be prayed once and then we work like crazy to make sure we can earn it. It's through the gospel that we not only have forgiveness of sins, but we also have power over sin to kill it, to live holy lives, become like Jesus. That happens also through the gospel. This is what we get to talk about over the next few weeks. I hope it's raised some questions. The Holy Spirit's working in us, shaping us, and equipping us, the saints, to do the work that he's called us to do. Because the words of Jesus that are recorded in Matthew 28, they speak directly into the world of a disciple. Before risen Jesus ascended into heaven, he made clear he wasn't just leaving us or abandoning us. In fact, he did the opposite. He equips us. He equips us with his word to teach us, his gospel that saves us, his spirit that guides us, and his church that connects us. And so we have this ultimate privilege to go into this beautifully upside-down world of a disciple of Jesus Christ. But we go in the proclamation of Jesus' power, and we go in the promise of His presence. And that changes everything. And and as we do, we get to answer Jesus' prayer that he prayed over his church. In John 17, and we'll close here, Jesus prays, God, in the same way that you have sent me, remember that in John 3? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In the same way that you have sent me, I am sending them into the world. Verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. My prayer is for all of those who believe in me through their message. All of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you and me 
so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. I pray that we get to experience that. We get to live that as a body of Christ. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much that you've equipped us, that you've sent us. And Lord, now I pray that we would we'd have soft hearts. We'd be attentive to what you're speaking. And Lord, that you would continue. Man, thank you for being gracious. Thank you for loving us. Lord, as we go and we have those opportunities to enjoy and exalt you, we do it in the power of your gospel, not our own strength. We love you. We follow you. We say we're disciples of no one but you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, guys, we'll see you next week. Thanks for hanging with me. Part two comes next week.